So to the topic of today's panel is the ZK AVM security um, and how can we be convinced that the ZK AVM implementations that we're all working on are secure. So today I'm joined by Hai Chen who works with ScrollTech and has been like leading engineering there about implementing the ZK AVM. I'm with Jordi Bellina who's, who's part of the Polygon Hermes team and has been leading engineering there. Uh, one thing that strikes me about like the organizations of Polygon and Scroll is that their their willingness to collaborate. They've both been like big collaborators in in Xerox Park and are now exploring like how to secure the KVMs together. I'm also joined by David, who's on the uh, Ethereum Foundation security team and has a, a traditional background in in security and and audits and things like that. So I hope that today we can have a, a nice uh, kind of exploration of how we're going to be able to make the ZKVMs that we've been working on secure. So I, that's my first question. How can we, how can we secure the ZKVM? How, how can we secure the ZKVM? Uh, yeah, so yeah. hello everyone, I'm Hai Chen. So I think like the, so the ZKVM is a very complicated circuit. So to I think make sure like the uh, to make sure like the, the ZKM is secure, uh, we definitely need to go through like the all thorough auditing, like the having like auditors to look at look at the circuits, and probably I think like the maybe not even like a one single team of auditors, maybe have multiple teams look at that uh, again, again, uh, and then we can like find some bugs, and then we can fix that, uh, and then after that I think we also should do like the like on um, parallel we can do some bug bounty program which like have like the more community members who like the interest in to looking into this stuff. And then find any find any bugs or attack those things. Uh, that's I think like, like to have it more secure. Uh, and then last, I think maybe a little bit like to say like have some more advanced techniques like the Veridice people and other people like they describe have some more formal verification tools and then frameworks do like the model checking those kind of stuff. Also like I think like the initially maybe it's not scalable to a very large circuit, but I think we can eventually get to there. Uh, yeah, that's like my and maybe just to complement that and. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, open source. You know, that's probably the first step in in securing something. Uh, cryptography by obfuscation or just uh, you know a private cryptography. This 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 has, the, the humanity already has been tested that this doesn't, doesn't work. We have uh, experience Microsoft, Google, IBM. So big comp corporations that just pay a lot of money just uh, building private. Uh, uh, cryptography systems, we know that this is not the way to go. Uh, uh, we need as many A's as possible of all kinds uh, to take a look at the, at the code, at the protocols, and that's why it's the first, so the first must, this is not enough, but the first is that this needs to be open source, and the, the people, and spe especially the users, have to have uh, uh, access to this code. This is the, the, the first step. Okay, and from now on, let, let's start. At, as as in says, it's is is it's a complex system. So the first thing is the first problem that we are challenging is that uh, who can review that? Because it's something that's new. It's, it didn't exist before. We are creating a lot of primitives, a lot of you now the arithmetication, all the uh, because we're doing a lot of tricks and a lot of uh, things, and there is no experience. Uh, on that side. So the first thing is who's going to review that? Who's going to take a look? Who has the capacity uh, to, 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 to look at that? So the first step, and this is who, where we have started, uh, is uh, we're partnering here together just to, that is to, uh, to somehow uh, start teaching, start uh, explaining, uh, uh, explaining to the auditors, explaining to the community, explaining to anybody that's interested in the system. This is the first, so this is this is for sure is the first step if because we need to open and the first the open even if it's open source if nobody can understand what's in the in that repo it's like being closed source so so we need this to to open and to uh, explain to teach uh, to spread how we are who we are working and and, and 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 publishing that and this is the the the, the next step after that so when we have this Let's say minimal, minimal, uh, um, minimal, you know, minimal um, critical mass 
of uh, auditors and, and so on. Next step is okay. Then, then here is how we organize. You know, here is how we organize the, the, the auditing, and because we need to be here a little, we need to talk about procedures and we need to talk about how we specifications, how we write the good specifications, how we can split these specifications and uh, have them in the procedures. How can we clean the code? How can we uh, go? And this is this is going to be the probably the the, the the next step. And once we have this clear, we have this specification phase quite clear, that the things is, is quite clear, then it's a matter of uh, just taking a look. And even that, uh, we will never have the warranty, like any cryptographic system, we will never have the warranty that uh, the system is going to be 100% safe. Here, uh, we have the responsibility as projects to uh, invest as much as possible in resources. Uh, at least in, in, in the Polygon side, I'm, I'm sure that in, in most of the other projects too, uh, they will not launch anything until they feel uh, comfortable enough that the system is reasonably, reasonably safe. Okay, uh, okay. thank, thank uh, you, Jordi. Sorry, sorry. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, David, do you have any yeah. comments about this? Uh, yeah, uh, I think. So I think open source, multiple audits, um, I think education is important. The, for me, coming from like a traditional security research background, um, I think we have very strong software security research capabilities in the community. I think that there's, um, you know, there's multiple components here. There's like the L1 verifying contracts. And as you've seen in previous talks, you know, three or four years ago, we didn't really, we just knew what reentrancy was because uh, the big DAO hack. Now we have like 101 best practices for solidity coding. So we have like these different components, um, pillars to stand on, unfortunately with security, uh, it's kind of the weakest link issue here. So um, like we've got a great bug tracker for ZK stuff, um, but I kind of, where I see like a, a large gap is that we have a lot of ac academics um, that come from like a formal verification or like a mathematical uh, background. Um, and then we have these people that understand like implementation. So um, it's great to, to want like multiple audits, but we don't really have multiple firms that know how to audit. So the education stuff is like critical here. Um, some of the tooling stuff is reusable with like uh, formal uh, verification. But I think like over time, it's gonna be about this collaboration. Um, I think that this is like critical. I think, you know, you can look at some of these things and say like, hey, all these L2s are competing and I'm not sitting, I'm, you know, I'm, I work for the EF and I care about systemic things. Um, so I'm not like on an L2s team here. Um, but in the long run, like you could say, oh yeah, it's a zero sum game for these L2s. But if something catastrophic happens to any of them, I guarantee you it's a, like a, it's a positive sum in the negative direction for everyone. Nobody's going to trust billions of dollars on TBL here, and they're all just gonna go to optimistic rollups, right? So I think um, this approach here, I see Polygon, ZK EVM folks in the crowd, I see all these people working together, and Zero X Park kind of like hosting this community where academics can come together. I think that this is kind of the, the only path forward because it's the only missing thing that we have here um, that, that we don't have some like tried and true testing methodology. And so I don't think this is anything new for the blockchain uh, community. The prerequisites to understand smart contract security require you to understand decentralization, um, things like oracles, all these new primitives. And so we've had this already. We've seen people tackle things where you have to not just be an expert in like one domain, like software security. You have to understand economic security and all these things or the whole system falls apart. So I think this is just gonna be an evolution. Um, and I think that there's like, we're on the, the correct path uh, forward. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, so the ZKVM is a, is a very complicated piece of software. It has many components and those components interact with each other. And my next question is like, what components are you all specifically worried about? What's, what, what keeps you up at night? Uh, yeah, I see like the, so there are multiple pieces it's like in the uh, ZKVM circuits. So it's not like, a, so you know, architecture is not only one single circuit, it's actually a set of circuits that connect with each other and then they work together to uh, to suddenly like verify the EVM behavior is correctly, that the trace is correct. So I think like the, the first of all, like the most important piece is like the, the original the EVM circuits, which is the most like, central piece. It's kind of like the, uh, you model like the, the EVM of codes and then all the state transitions correctly. So those kind of things like I think, uh, so I think like the people usually like know how to do like the, so uh, integers like big integer multiplications and then uh, integer additions, but like if you, Need to be true like that. That the all of the constraint is very true to what EVM specs it does. Like the what Ethereum yellow paper defines how EVM works. 
there's a lots of like the corner cases if you look into the details. So those are corner cases that usually will be uh, easily overlooked. So I think that's like the one thing like very important to do uh, to check. And then the second thing is that so the because the circuits need to work together, they need to connect through some lookup tables uh, to to be sure. And then certain things like maybe checking one circuit and certain property will be guaranteed by another circuit. Uh, then how can we guarantee that this, like the com combination of the, all the circuits is a sound and a complete one like to check everything that you have inside the EVM uh, to fully guarantee uh, the ZK EVM is correct. So I think like, this is the kind of two biggest things like, uh, I think it would be uh, important to, to audit the ZK EVM. So, so like you're saying that like the two big in, uh, issues are the corner cases and the interfaces between the different components. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think that makes sense. Jordi? Yeah, we have a kind of maybe a different architecture uh, on that, so probably the pieces are different on that side. Here I would say two parts. One is the what we call it the ROM, or if you want, is the 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 code that actually implements the EVM uh, itself. There is uh, a lot of lines of code, and this is like it's like writing a smart contract. You know, it's it's at the end uh, single uh, mistake in one of the lines can screw up everything. And, and, and this is, well, this is concerning. <laughs> this is uh, because it's, it's, it's critical code and if you see the number of lines that are in there are um, a lot. Actually, it's, you can imagine Geth, but Brighton in assembly, you know, it's just, it's, it's a complex code there, okay? So this is probably my biggest concern at this point. And then there is the remetization. In our case, the remetization is, is uh, probably much more simple uh, because at the end we have just a kind of a processor there, so the, all the logic is more in the wrong part. But uh, but it's not a it's a very new language. It's a very new thing. It's something that uh, we don't have uh, experience uh, designing identity polynomial identities uh, uh, on that side. So and it's very very easy to 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 miss some something or don't take in account something and uh, and so on so probably these are the two things that are more concerned but i cannot forget you know even the smart contract uh, that i'm there uh, and, and more th things that are more uh, basic if you want but <laughs> they need to be safe too I, I find that there's this misunderstanding in the space where people equivocate like L1 to L1 bridges with L1 to L2 bridges, and I, I, I think that it's the problem is that they call it even bridges. No, I, w I, I, I would like to go back to the uh, double pegging for for chain to chain, uh -huh. and uh, and the, the and this is maybe it's a bridge, but it's a trustless bridge. It's it's just a smart contract. Just it's a mechanism to moving funds, but it's not what we understand as. A, Classical breach of you know just a kind of a multi sig where you need to trust some yep. some party. Yeah, absolutely. So so to be clear, L two bridges are much more secure than L one bridges. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I think I think that, like this kind of just like points to um, a lack of like true terminology. Everybody's marketing right now. Um, so. I would say like L2 bridges, I would call them fast bridges where there's like a third party and they're taking the risk. So if there's a double spend on one of these bridges, like the person that's getting the 1% uh, fee for transferring your, you know, off of an optimistic rollup and letting you not take the seven day wait period or between two ZK EVMs or whatever, like they, they get a yield and they take the risk and they're the ones that's like, you know, out of luck if something happens. Um, for me, like I'm not sitting here thinking like, what's the like worst doomsday scenario uh, for my ZK EVM. Um, I'm thinking like what happens to ETH when something bad happens to ZK EVM and I, I hate to say it but like something bad is going to happen. We've seen double spin bugs in Aztec, we've seen them in um, Zcash, we've like these things are a big deal. The one thing that's like the saving grace for Ethereum here is that we have a native non-privacy like token standard at the base layer. And the reason this is important is because you can see when there's insolvency in a contract. Whereas if you just had like the ZK uh, like roll up and this is your entire ecosystem and everything is either private or it's using ZK to scale, you might not know that somebody's printed infinity tokens or that some other wallet has negative tokens and that's like how your constraints add up. And so for me, it's like this lack of transparency here. I think that there's some like traditional security, um, like, 
philosophy that we can apply here. Um, you can do things like have like buckets. And I understand like if you're trying to do something like scale, this isn't that big of a deal. If you're trying to do something like staying private, having buckets for like your your like zero knowledge cash type transfers, like you can think of like tornado cash, that it reduces the anonymity set. So like there are some issues here, but there are also things that we're starting to see now um, where you might have like a withdrawal. Like we do see these like chain to chain bridges that aren't really bridges. Um, they maybe can have like a uh, like a floodgate mechanism. Like if somebody is going to drain the entire contract, that's probably not normal when there's 100,000 users that are using your L2. So like if 10% of the contract exits in a 24 hour period, maybe having like these kill switches um, will be good. And then you can do things like have guarantees where if there is an issue, everybody takes a 10% or a 20% haircut on their TBL and nobody's left holding like the complete miss, like, like lost bag. I do think though that like, you know, if there is something systemic and like a, like a multi-billion dollar uh, ZK EVM gets basically drained, um, and this is a problem, then at least the base layer of Ethereum is like still there and, and we can still make those like trust and rebuild. And so for me, the like the scariest part here is the new technology. I mean, people were afraid, they, they, people don't really understand like the zero spin problem until they see that like Bitcoin has gone up over time and like, well, yeah, there's nothing behind it. There's all this stuff, but there's somebody willing to buy it from you right now for $20,000, right? And so over time, people like start to trust these things. And I think of like, uh, if you guys have seen the Indiana Jones where he's like stepping on the, the like different pieces and like one of them falls through, or like if you're crossing a creek, you kind of want to like feel the rock that you're going to put all your weight on before you go. I think that that's going to be the same thing here. We're going to have to like have people start to to trust you know the cryptography that they don't understand yet like this is all moon math to, to the average person right even like advanced security engineers don't understand any of this stuff and so there's this gap between the understanding of like you know this this like high level multi-dimensional matrix math that you guys all understand and then like the people that like know what like a traditional software bug looks like and so that gap right there is the is the scariest thing and the lack of transparency if something goes wrong is is also scary to me but you know you can mitigate some of that risk by bucketizing and these other things i've mentioned so. I, I think that like what resonates with me about what you were saying was how it's really nice to have this L, this roll-up centric roadmap so that we're able to experiment with these new things and we're able to build systems that with time can, can get the kind of trust that we need. Cool. So my next question is, so when I do audits, what I normally do is to, I try to find things that like people don't know or that the developer didn't know when they were writing the code. So what are some of the things that people don't know about, about like your code or things that could be interesting for people to pay attention to? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. It's like, I'm not sure like the, <laughs> you hear audits, what audits that does like the, when they do like auditing, but I think like there'll be things like I think behind like the for example the proving system like whether those interfaces that you use is correct or like even behind like there's some repository like dependency you use like the on top of that whether that's uh, secure like I think that's uh, one thing and then I think another piece is like uh, there's a lot of optimization tricks and then that could be make the circuits like less readable uh, uh, which like the I think auditors may find like that's very uh, hard to understand certain part of the logic of the circuits so I think that seems like we should explain uh, those kind of things uh, to the to the auditors, um, and I think in addition, like there's some certain assumptions we make, like in certain uh, part of gadgets or part of the circuits, like you make certain assumptions, and I think those things like are very important. Like uh, maybe only the developers uh, who develop those circuits knows about that, but I think you need to. Uh, those are things like are important to put down in the specs so that the auditors can know like the why you are doing certain things and the why like you are not doing certain things. I think. There are many things, but uh, one, one, one that's important and the concern is that from what we have seen in the, in the, in the program, it's a non-deterministic, uh, so it's a non-deterministic circuit. And it's non-deterministic means that, for example, you want to do a division, actually what you do is you put uh, the result and then you check the, the multiplication, okay? And tricks like that, uh, well, there are many. For example, when, when we are where we are uh, uh, scanning transactions, actually, what we are doing is we are hashing all the transactions. But we, we are putting all the data. All this data is we call it free input, okay? And then we are uh, we have a constraint that calculates the hash somehow, and then the hash is the public output that that, that what, what needs to be matched, okay? But you can put anything in there. Uh, 
it's okay because you have to hash. But this kind of, um, this is something that for a normal programmer, for a normal, um, ref, uh, normal programmer, is something strange. It's something that's not used to. It's something that's different. And this needs to be explained very well. It's seen, this we have seen, for example, internally in the team. You know, in the team, maybe it's just the people uh, that just learn things. It's people that, you know, they come from uh, other backgrounds. And uh, it's natural that uh, when you first write these programs, and you do a lot of mistakes because you don't have, uh, you didn't absorb this uh, concept. Of course, you repeat that, you do it again, and, and, and then the people is getting it. But it's something that needs to be explained very well, because uh, I think this could be uh, one of the big uh, sources of uh, problems uh, in there. I, I actually don't have uh, any real good input for this question, so right. leave it there. Cool. Thank you. Um, my next question is, how can traditional tools help us? Uh, when we're trying to secure the KVM. Uh, yeah, let me just start with like one most simple thing is like setting everything to zero and see if I can pass. And that's like in a lot of cases you can pass, like, uh, which is not correct in, the, in your circuit. So that's like one simple thing. And another thing like uh, uh, some uh, basic things like fuzzing. So I think like the in a zero knowledge circuit, I think the fuzzing could be like slightly different. You know, like fuzzing arbitrary data that's put inside your circuit witness, but that's it's very easy. To, you don't like that, the, uh, that like the, it won't pass the proof because like it's there's lots of constraint checks. So you need to be very careful to make some uh, counter cases to make sure like the there's some invalid things that you put into the circuit, but uh, then can pass that. Uh, but I think like in the context of the ZK EVM is that you can generate uh, arbitrary trace like that you can you can fast the trace of the, the from the EVM and then see like that's uh, if, if that can pass uh, I think like that's like the what Meredith was just like talking about like that those fuzzing will be very helpful like to to uh, use like generate some valid trace and some invalid trace and then just and then you can tweak a little certain small amount of things like inside the trace to make things like the uh, that should not be passed, but if they pass the circuit, then there's some bugs inside that. Yeah. yeah, in general, all these formal verification tools, uh, with maybe with some adoption, with some adoption uh, specifics, but can be used at least to, to, to understand better some parts of the circuit. Maybe not like everything, but uh, there are specific pieces that are quite clear and that work very well, or that can work very well. Uh, with this tooling, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, the arithmetic state machine. In our case, this is very clear. You know, it's arithmetic. You know, this must be a multiplication and cannot do anything else. This is something that uh, formal verification people love to see these 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 clear patterns uh, in there. So I'm sure that uh, some work can be done uh, there. Uh, if you go to the main processor, that's uh, is not that mathematically well defined. It maybe there they have more uh, uh, more problems, and then here is where free fuzzy logic may make, make 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 more sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely can 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 help. And here maybe it's a call eh, for people that's expert in, in, in some. It's, it's, it's good to understand and to see how this this thing works because I'm sure that there is a lot of tooling and a lot of these things that can be very helpful and we are and we don't even know uh, that those tools exist so here is uh, it's important for the community to be proactive here the 0x part people is doing a great job on that and there is people that's already uh, looking at that and there are some ideas that things can be done in there uh, that's important again it's just uh, explaining because when you when you really understand the circuits when you really see what it is you, you, you can find people that's expert in that material that, that, that can see ways to that can help a lot um, I think so formal verification has been mentioned uh, formal verification and it's like you can only do so much in like a regular security testing and so it just so happens that there's like so much math in these circuits here um, that it just lends really well to this so I'm, I'm really excited about that um, first of all it's like the first time I think I've seen it applied in a way where I'm like well this is gonna be a big part of my life I need to go read you know brush the dust off of all the textbooks um, another thing is that there's like a lot of there's like a lot of traditional things um, with security audits that, that actually lend well to, to these also. And like a good example would be like typing, like strong typing is, is serious in regular security. You have integer underflows, you have integer overflows, you have casting errors, things can flip negative. And 
you see this in these circuits, but you also see like um, there's sometimes optimizations, and developers do this stuff naturally. Um, a good example is like the Aztec 2.0, uh, maybe was not ever exploited, but what was reported, there was like an input that was 128 bits or 64 bits, and the actual constraint was only 32 bits. So you could actually provide multiple nullifiers that pass all the constraints, which means you could potentially like withdraw from Zcash type thing more than once, um, even though you only deposited once. And that is something that is queryable, and you can just have a strong typing system. So like the, a correct static analysis tool that was that like could have could have been applied to that and just said, hey, error, manual like review required, this input over here is a larger, is a different type than this, like the way it's used and casted over here. So anytime there's like a casting error, you can have this. I think there's going to be like plenty of other queryable examples like this where we can apply traditional security tools towards this. Cool. Um, so where do we need to make new tools? To Like Lucas talked earlier about his exploration of trying to make a polynomial solver. And like, there seems like there's a lot of scope for us to explore. Like, where would you like to see new tools? Yeah, I think like the, so a lot of tools, like I mentioned, like from traditional, like formal verification, they are not very ready, I think, for the uh, proving the, Z, uh, the, the ZK, like the circuits. So I think like those things like will be very good to have. And then I think like not only like some tools like from the uh, like for auditing, I think that like there's more tools will be uh, very useful from the proof system side. It's like they can provide you a very easy to use interface to uh, generate some arbitrary like the uh, error cases like you can inside the circuit and also have a very um, bug reporting for example, where does the circuits fail? I think those kind of bug reporting will be also very important tools as they can auxiliary uh, make the, the auditing and then make the testing like the more easier and then uh, easier to uh, find some bugs. Yeah, clearly this uh, bug reporting. No, we, we launched the testnet, the public testnet on, on, on Monday. We already got uh, a report of a, uh, an error. It was nothing crazy, but it, it was already a bug that we already fixed it. Uh, and that was because we published that and somebody just tested that and yeah. just put something there. So. Is this the importance of uh, uh, testing the things? And I agree. The, the back reporting is, is, is you know, when you see something that goes wrong, you need to investigate until the last and fully understand what's going on because you probably you have something mm. that can be getting worse. Um, I think a formal specification for differential fuzzing would be really cool. Um, I think that. There's like a value add when you could take like 10 different ZK EVMs and you could potentially throw a test case at each of them and then you can compare the output states afterwards. Um, I think the value add here is that everybody wants to be part of it because you're going to know that you're conforming to the spec if, you know, if your output matches everyone else's. This has been incredibly fruitful with our consensus layer clients in Ethereum for the beacon chain. So we have five clients. There's certain things that are in the spec like processing an epoch transition. And so we can hand it like us for it's a it's a specified beacon block object and we can run it through every one of them and we can diff all the outputs afterwards and that's like incredibly valuable right like that's uncovered multiple bugs that would be like chain splitting bugs and these types of bugs like in the l2 world would mean that you would have a state diff between the l1 and the l2 which means double spins it means all kinds of other like horrible things can happen um, another thing that i think is really important is uh, like zoomed out from the zk abm it's more like about um, l1 contracts in general and that's like a like an open security standard of like ahead of time, hey, if you're a white hat and you find a bug, um, please report it to us, obviously, like we'll resolve it privately. But there are some cases in the security world where like a vulnerability primitive drops and everybody hears about it at the exact same freaking time. And like when that happens, you've actually seen this like be fruitful where white hats will front run black hats, they'll steal all the money out of the contract and then they'll return it like and you know maybe get a bounty or whatever and so having like a previous specified like hey uh on your bug bounty page have a little thing down there that's like yo if if you guys drain a billion dollars of tvl from my contract this is how much the white hat bounty is and up, we're like legally saying you're off the hook ahead of time if you return it all and you do all this kind of stuff and we are seeing some of this stuff kind of come out and flush out in like the DeFi ecosystem there's gonna be like a spec that's being working with worked on right now with the open security standard or alliance or something like that. I think there will be more information about this like in a few months. I think this is all just kind of like in the community right now. But I think that that's going to be huge because if you know ahead of time, I, I know a lot of like white hats that they just don't want to touch stuff like this. So there was like, a, I think it was like the Nomad hack 
a bunch of people were able to just replace like the public key to receive funds and replay the, the attacker's uh, original like exploit. And they were all like a bunch of white hats stepped up and started draining this contract. And it was weird. You could only drain like a little bit at a time. So they were able to like actually recover a certain amount of the funds. And you know, it sounds weird to say like, hey, we're going to give you a white hat bounty if you hack our contract and steal all of our crap. But this is like a, a phenomenon that keeps reappearing where everybody hears about the vulnerability at the same time. And we do need people to drain these contracts at a time. So like that's one example of something like that. Um, thank, and thank, I, thank you, David. Ahead. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, so my last, next question is like, um, um, it's a harder one. So when would you all feel comfortable to put all of Ethereum's assets inside your ZKVM? Yeah, that's a <laughs> tricky one. So I, uh, I think like the, so when we launch the mainnet, I think that it will be, I assume like that's audited and I'll be like very happy to do that on myself. Yeah. We have the experience of Hermes One and other, you know, other um, real production life, and yeah, it's a hard decision. Uh, in general, I I look at the age of the people that audit uh, that, and it's who audited that. And I'm talking the specific guy. I don't care about the the brand, and it's just the guy, and 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 even. The kind of uh, questions that the auditor made, uh, how deep they went, and uh, the experience that this person has. When you put all these pieces together, so it's just, but you need to know personally, like each of the auditors, each of the in internal and external auditors, and each person of the people, you just check to all the places. And uh, here is just a feeling. It's, it's, it's a feeling that, okay, this is. Uh, this uh, should be reasonable safe. That's a feeling. Eh? It's not. Uh, I wouldn't. It's difficult to put a parameter because what you say is say, oh, it, we need two of these. We need three of these. We need four persons, three persons. It's really, it's really hard because these persons. You now I see now it's. I pay it out it's that I'm sure that the guys that made the audit they didn't check the, the smart contract at all, and I seen that. Okay, so it's not. So okay, we have two audits. And, and I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm, I'm not gonna trust. If the, if the, if depending on the who made the audit. Mm. Okay. So that's it's more personal thing. It's personal people who made what what the questions they did, what scan it, where they went, and this is when you you I would feel comfortable. But it's a very personal decision. And it's a very uh, uh, feeling decision. So it's it's, it's hard. Mm. Uh, to the answer, all of Ethereum's assets, I say never. Um, I think I think the ZK EVM for L1 will be good for having like statelessness and being able to sync a light client instantly without having to download all the trans and all the transaction history. I think there's like value there, but I think just like everything else here, um, time is the thing that like makes you trust it. People trust Uniswap because Uniswap has a natural bug bounty of billions of dollars sitting in it right now. Anyone can go after it. So like time will tell the analogy of like kind of stepping and feeling the rock. I think that's important. But I think that like bounties are, are a big deal and, and these things naturally have bounties. Um, open source is important. You need lots of eyes. But Shellshock and Heartbleed were in the Linux kernel for like how long? I mean, every for ten years, every single like seventy-five percent of the computers connected to the internet had an arbitrary kernel read, and nobody knew about it, right? Somebody was probably using that the whole time. So for me, like you know, this stuff is very new. ECDSA tried and true. Like sure, BLS, like we 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 took some like we can do this because we want to aggregate signatures, and the trade-off was important. But we're not putting zk in the consensus layer right now for a reason. And this is like, I mean, I sat in a backyard with Vitalik and, and Dan Benet, and you know, this guy's been doing ZK stuff since the 70s when nobody cared about it. Um, and now we're in a golden age of cryptography and we're implementing it. And he was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in the consensus layer. So we're taking baby steps in the consensus layer, SSLE, so that we can prevent, um, we can have privacy about who's proposing next so they can't DDoS, like targeted DDoS our proposers and proof of stake. That's like the only place we're taking a tiny little baby step of ZK. Um, I think beyond that, everything else is, there's a reason you have like this, there, there's no privacy and like, 
like ZK scaling in the in the layer one. And I talked a little bit about contract solvency. I think that like my golden future for Ethereum is that all nation states are issuing their CBDCs and they have their privacy, they have their KYC, all these things in their ZK roll up. And then we can all say like, yep, the US government actually has something to back up their reserves, right? Which is something that's a benefit on our current system. If we didn't see the M1 and M2 money chart, and if we even trust that, we don't actually know how many dollars are, are out there because nothing's backed by gold anymore. So I think there's a reason, I think there's always a trade off. I think anytime you take a bridge, whether it's ZK or it's an optimistic roll up, you end up inheriting the risk of all of the pieces there, whether it's the fraud proving or anything. And I think that people will do things like, like uh, have their, their large company or their large corporation or their large government having their financial reserves being completely visible on the L1 contract. And then all the fun, scalable, private stuff we can do with ZK, we do on top of that. And, and we take the risk trade-offs the same way that you have a bank account and you have the cash in your wallet. Thank you, David. Um, I think I only have time for one more question. Uh, so my last question, and hopefully we can go through this quickly, is uh, what's your favorite security bug? Uh, yeah, I think like the, my first secure bug is like the, I think previously for the Zcash, they have like a trusted setup like, and then they put like an one extra additional points to there, which like allow people to do like an infinite like uh, counterfeit some uh, Zcash tokens on top of that. And then that was like, but wasn't fun for like a many years until like a, everyone like found out that bug inside that. I think that's a very epic one. <laughs> Security bug in general, or specific to the to the EVM that we are building? In general, I, I can I can, in general, well, I can I can I can tell you the intern the, the the internal one. Oh, I mean, no. This is this is the <laughs> no no, but it's it's it, I think it's a good example of uh, this is a bug that we actually found. But this is a good example that is okay. We found this bug, but you know, we couldn't find for sure. You know, I tell you, it's like in the sparse Merkle tree. There is a condition. Some point at some point, there is a condition that you need to check that when you are deleting that uh, the key, you need to check that the key that the key is, is the same. That that's not the same key. That there is a, so there is a check that they need, you need to do that. Mm. Um, we didn't. Well, the, the first implementation, that check was not there, and when I saw that, is it's so easy to forget that check. It's so easy. That's when you realize how complex this is. This is this, and this was found by well, by the, the person that was documenting the was documenting the, the, the this part of the of the storage. But if if it exists this, uh, what else can be in there? And this is the this is the the the, the, the concern and, and, and the learnings. Um, I have like a million favorite bugs, so I'll say the ZK specific ones. I, I think that the uh, the like lack of auditability because of the privacy that ZK inherits here is just really cool. Uh, I mean, you see these L1 contracts get hacked and like Twitter's excellent at like broadcasting information in like this like distributed network way where if you follow somebody like you can like InfoSec Twitter, I know about bugs be wait, before potentially the developers do because like it just gets spread so fast. And you cannot see a DeFi protocol get hacked now and not know in like 30 minutes if you're keyed into crypto and InfoSec Twitter. Um, I think it's really cool like that a hacker could like basically steal all the funds, slide out the back door, and nobody would know for like years potentially because of the ZK. I think that's just really cool. But. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.